Uh, my name is Juan Andre Guerrero Saade. As Christina was nice enough to introduce me, I'm with the Global Research and Analysis Team, the great team at Kaspersky Lab. Um, and let me tell you that we're particularly happy to be able to announce this to all of you today. So, first of all, for those of you that don't know GREAT or the Global Research and Analysis Team, this is an elite research unit. We're about uh, 45 security researchers around the world. Uh, our focus is primarily on cyber espionage, high-end financial threats, sabotage, um, operations, which we're going to be discussing today, uh, but also some ransomware, some IoT, some smart cities, and we try to make sure that we're not only covering the gamut of research, but that we can also take on uncompromising research in this space um, from a global perspective. So make sure that we're protecting as many people as we can, that we're staying on top of new threat actors and tracking threat actors no matter where uh, they may be doing their business. So. On that, as our you know big boss likes to say, we're here to save the world, and I hope that today uh, that can become apparent, particularly when we're discussing a wiper operation. Uh, for those of you that might not be familiar with Grace Research, especially in the APT space, you can get a bit of a snapshot here of, of sort of what we've been working on, starting with Stuxnet in 2010, uh, ranging through favorites like Dooku, Flame, Mini Flame, Gauss, uh, but also you know Red October, Winti. Uh, equation group, satellite Turla, and if you can see, actually, this is a bit of an outdated tree, so we've got another uh, year and so worth of, of announcement and new threat actors, most of which are getting reported privately to our customers in the threat intelligence subscription space, uh, but for whom we hope we can still kind of lift the veil every so often and, and allow you all to see the kind of things that we're working with and what we can provide our customers um, and the global awareness of these operations. So let's focus on wipers. I'm particularly interested in the subject of wipers. I'm actually quite excited that we get to talk about this today because uh, wipers are a very interesting subsection of what happens with cyber espionage, and they really only come around very rarely. The reason um, wiper operations or sabotage operations are so rare is they actually tend to run counter to what you might expect uh, an advanced threat actor to be interested in, uh, particularly in the realm of access. In a cyber espionage operation, what you would normally see with an APT, gaining access is a very valuable thing, and maintaining it silently is even more important. It's great to be able to use that access and maintain that access stealthily for as long as possible to gain as much visibility and awareness into that space uh, for as long as possible. A cyber espionage operation with a wiper component or a cyber sabotage operation exclusively um, essentially runs counter to all those purposes because by the time that you start wiping systems or, or sabotaging them, taking them offline, it's going to become increasingly obvious to your target and to your, to your victim that you have gained access, that there is an attacker on the network. Um, and obviously that the systems are not their own anymore and they're, they're expected to start remediation as quickly as possible. Um, wipers are particularly uh, infamous because they do tend to cost a great deal of money insofar as operational expenses. There doesn't have to be a very sophisticated component to them, but if you take down all of the machines in a um, critical site of a company, then you're obviously going to cost them a great deal of money. Now, as you can see some of this history, Shamoon plays a very interesting a role in the history of wipers, particularly because one of the other most infamous wipers, that of uh, the Lazarus Group, also known as Dark Soul or known for the infamous Sony Pictures attack, uh, actually takes a great deal of inspiration from the original Shamu, which used a certain type of driver component uh, in order to do its its business. And actually, the, the Lazarus actor copied the same technique in order to do their own business. Uh, and as you might see, there's a little new component to this. Um, chart of wipers, and that's something that we're going to discuss today as well. So, you know, maybe with a little bit of patience, we can keep some of that surprise. All right, so the original Shamoon attack, as I've mentioned, is quite famous. Um, it started in 2012, specifically in August 2012. Uh, the way that it worked was you would um, infect a machine inside of a network with Shamoon, and then it had a sort of worm component whose intention was to attempt to spread to as many machines as possible on that network. Uh, then there would be a certain firing date, a sort of kill date, uh, when the wiper component would go off on all these infected machines, uh, and they would wipe all the machines, making them inoperable. There was a particular group that took credit um, for these attacks at the time, but sadly, well, I was about to say sadly from a research perspective, um, 
Shamoon went inoperative around that time. We never heard from them again for years. And honestly, this has been a particular surprise to be able to say uh, that Shamoon has come back. But we have uh, so far seen three waves of new Shamoon attacks with intended kill dates for the 17th of November, the 29th of November, um, and the 23rd of January. So we've seen three new waves so far. Um, and I think there's some interesting features there that despite the amount of attention that Shamoon has gotten, or Shamoon 2.0, if you will, uh, there actually has not been enough discussion about some of these new features that we're seeing in, in the malware. So some of the key findings that we're going to discuss today uh, include sort of the infection vectors or sort of the lateral movement spread uh, vectors of, of Shamoon 2.0, uh, some of the quirks of the command and control modules, uh, and some interesting functionality that hasn't been discussed in this class. And moreover, something that I'm particularly excited about, we're actually going to discuss some of the methods by which we uh, sort of explore this attack, hunt for new variations, and uh, down to the detail of just how we did that and what results that yielded for us. So I hope that it can be interesting for you as well. So first and foremost, some of the lateral movement techniques uh, that we see in Shamoon 2.0. This is actually a chart of the credentials that we could find from different Shamoon 2.0 samples. And the reason that this is important is Shamoon doesn't use any particular trickery when it comes to lateral movement. Instead, what the attackers do is that they hard code credentials, uh, particularly of domain administrators that you know, might give them access to other machines within the same network. So they really only need to uh, have infected one machine with Shamoon once the uh, credentials have been uh, embedded and hard-coded into the malware. And then that uh, the malware will actually use several different techniques leveraging those credentials in order to attempt to execute and embed itself into um, other machines within that network. But it's all entirely dependent on having credentials. There's no exploit magic involved in this. Uh, one of the interesting quirks about this is it actually means that they must have had some level of access to some of the victim um, networks that, they, that they're targeting in order to get these credentials originally. So I think that there are aspects of this campaign uh, that are still a little elusive for us. There's still mysteries for everybody investigating them. And that's one of the issues that occurs with sabotage operations is just as you take down all these different machines within a victim network, uh, the attackers are also ensuring that most of the artifacts of their attacks are also likely to be lost. One of the twists and functionality that hasn't been discussed a whole lot and that you know I found it quite interesting they have not is as we were deep diving through the Shamoon 2.0 malware, we actually found um, a, a different bit of functionality. We found a ransomware implementation. Now, I think the reason that hasn't been discussed is uh, we don't believe that this has been used in the wild so far, uh, but it appears that the Shamoon actor is considering the possibility of using the same malware uh, with a ransomware component in order to hold a victim or an organization hostage. Uh, whether it'll be for financial profit or some other more idealistic gain remains to be seen, uh, but we can definitely see some of the implementations of RC4 and an, AE, an RSA public key embed it within the malware already. So it's more a matter of uh, the attackers deciding to use this functionality instead of the wiping functionality, uh, and it looks like all the code base is already in place. So we think that this is an interesting uh, variation, interesting development and evolution of what's happening with, with Shamoon after these four years that wasn't present in the original. Some of the discussion about Shamoon always goes back to, you know, the, the standard who done it. We want to know, everybody wants to know who's behind this thing. I think that this is a particularly interesting case insofar as we think there's a certain amount of potential manipulation. And, and the issue of false flags is one that I'm uh, particularly invested in. If any of you might have seen, we actually released a paper recently uh, with one of my fellow great researchers, Brian Bartholomew. Uh, and you can look into some of our discussion of, of false flags and deception tactics from advanced threat actors in APT research, uh, which we published a few months back on SecureList. So keeping that in mind, keeping the possibility of false flags in mind, we're of course going to take a few steps back from the notion of providing any definitive attribution. And regardless, this really wouldn't be a clear case. Some of the indicators that we see within the malware are, for example, a leftover debug path that refers to the Arabian Gulf, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing is, you know, we're seeing Arabian Gulf instead of, for example, Persian Gulf, uh, some of the uh, regional variants that you might consider in language. 
Uh, another such thing is the use of the um, Arabic transliteration she knew, uh, which would actually just translate to the word what, uh, but it's only used in certain very specific Arabic dialects and not other ones. Similarly, there are some leftover um, language resources within the malware that would point to uh, Yemeni Arabic settings. However, we do hope that you keep a certain level of healthy skepticism in mind and remember that these uh, attributory artifacts are very easy to manipulate. They are often manipulated by attackers. And this is an attacker that's had a particular, uh, particularly long amount of time to sort of cook, develop, and, and watch out carefully for what researchers might be doing uh, when it comes to discovering their malware. So as I promised, I said we were going to discuss some of the details of how we at GREAT go about hunting this sort of thing, how we go about uh, our discovery process in order to uh, move laterally from just a single sample or several samples that we may have discovered uh, in order to learn more and maybe understand more of a campaign of what a threat actor might be doing, whether or there are further evolutions of the malware. Uh, and I'm always very excited to kind of reveal some of our methods and see what some of you might think about these things. And in this case, it, it actually serves our story quite well. So first and foremost, when we, when we saw the new Shamoon come along, we decided, you know, obviously we want to know this is a monumental operation, which Shamoon was able to do the first time around. And we'd of course love to know what they're doing now and make sure that we're protecting our customers as well as possible. So um, we asked, we busted out our favorite tool, which is Yara. For those of you that are unfamiliar with Yara, this is an open source uh, tool called the uh, Pattern Matching Swiss Army Knife. It is our favorite by far. It essentially allows researchers to describe a pattern and describe certain features that should be in a binary, that might be in a program and an executable in a file, uh, and to then go hunting uh, by writing a little rule and saying, you know, this is the kind of thing that we expect to see. What do you find? In this particular case, we knew that the Shamoon 2.0 malware would most likely rely on certain features that we could hunt for, even if we didn't know exactly what new versions of Shamoon might look like. So some of those features were, for example, some of the Windows APIs that Shamoon was bound to use in order to look for and enumerate different files and folders inside of the systems that it was looking to wipe. So we could write a rule that said, well, first and foremost, we know that it's going to need uh, the find first file and find next file APIs. These are some of the ways in which Windows is going to allow the malware to enumerate the files that it would like to wipe. Then we know uh, that Shamoon actually um, saves some of the payload inside of an encrypted resource within its own body. So it would need to use Windows API functions in order to find that resource, then load that resource in order to then execute that payload. So that's another two APIs that we can hunt for. Uh, similarly, some of the resources would be inside of a inside of a resource called uh, 101. It would be the same name for all of the samples. And since it was encrypted or packed, we knew that that resource would have a level of entropy that was particularly high, uh, a level of entropy that we knew implied a certain amount of, of, of perhaps randomness. And we could say, uh, you know, by all of our testing with these different rules, uh, that about 7.8 to 7.9 or something higher than that would give us the level of entropy that we expected to see in some of these encrypted payloads. Um, so then we added a little bit more trickery. We said, you know, we expect this payload to be about this size. We expect the binary to start with this header. Um, and essentially, what you come up with is this Yara rule right here. I'm more than happy to share it with you. If any of you, uh, just the fact that I believe that it's mostly uh, journalists, but if any of you have a latent interest in some uh, threat intel hunting, you're more than welcome to run some of these rules yourself. Uh, but you can see some of the things that we described, some of the APIs being um, in place there, uh, some of the section names, uh, some of the entropy checks, and the file size checks. So. This is exactly how we went about uh, searching for more samples of Shamoon, and uh, we actually got very, very lucky. So not only did we discover uh, more Shamoon 2.0 samples around that time, we were able to cluster Shamoon 2.0 samples as you might have expected of a good Yara rule, uh, we also found something else within the samples that, that came up firing from this uh, Shamoon rule. And that's something that we have taken to call Stone Drill. So here's a bit of an overview of what we're going to discuss with Stone Drill. It's uh, entirely new malware. It had not been discovered before. 
Uh, it has some, it shares some similar style with Shamoon. Let's, uh, we wouldn't go so far as to say that it is a new version of Shamoon, but it definitely shares enough similarities with Shamoon that it allowed us, uh, or it allowed itself to be discovered by the same means uh, that we would apply in order to, to find and cluster Shamoon 2.0 samples. Uh, that said, it uses a new technique for implementing the wiper functionality. It has enhanced uh, evasion techniques, and it actually shares a connection with a known APT actor uh, that we wouldn't connect with Shamoon itself. So I think that it should uh, prove quite interesting for you um, going forward. So let's discuss some of that. So the one of the big differences with, uh, with Stone Drill is that rather than using the driver technique that I mentioned Shamoon uh, inspired in some of the Lazarus group wipers used in the Sony attack, which is the use of a perfectly legitimate driver by uh, the Eldos company. Um, instead of using any of that, the stone drill authors decided uh, to inject their wiper functionality directly into the, the victim's preferred browser. So when a machine is infected with stone drill, it actually um, will have that wiper functionality injected into their preferred browser, or if it's a 64-bit system, it might actually have that wiper functionality injected directly into Internet Explorer. And the idea is that in this way, uh, the attackers can bypass some security measures, they can bypass some endpoint security software uh, by uh, doing their wiping operations directly from a trusted process. Uh, Stone drill is actually quite interesting as well insofar as its multifunctionality. Uh, it not only is a wiping platform, it also has some spying components. And uh, it actually has no fuzz about, you know, not having the ability to wipe a system. If it just so happens to not be able to wipe, it will go ahead and delete files in a different fashion. Uh, and it, you know, includes a, a certain amount of, of code complexity that we would consider similar to Shamoon. Also, if you might notice, for those of you staring at that picture in the middle of the screen, uh, there's the similarities in entropy in some of the sections. Uh, there's also some Persian language resources, which, once again, please, you know, take this with a grain of salt. However, uh, it's quite interesting insofar as, as some of the similarities that it might share with a new speech, which we will discuss further. So as I was saying, the, depending on some of the configuration for Stone Drill, uh, what you can see is its ability to wipe files with a certain amount of random data. Uh, first, it will go, you know, depending on the configuration, it will go through and attempt to overwrite the physical drives directly. Uh, it will attempt to overwrite the logical drives. It will attempt to recursively wipe and delete many of the folders um, in, in some of the logical drives. So, you know, it'll, like we said, it would need to enumerate all these different files on the drive and then go through and attempt to um, overwrite them with random data and delete them. Um, and then interestingly enough, if you can see that, that uh, string of what looks like random letters, um, it, it looks for a very specific naming convention of files, you know, starting with ASDH. It looks like somebody mashed on the keyboard for a little bit and a certain number uh, of digits attached to the end. And if it finds this, it, it places a particular focus on deleting these files. Uh, now, chances are that these are uh, files or logs or components that have something to do with other stone drill operations. Uh, but at this time, we haven't been able to further identify it. I can assure you that it's a part of our ongoing investigations and we're placing a great deal of emphasis on understanding this aspect of stone drill. So if we do come up with something, we'll be more than happy to, to share this with you as well. So once the wiping process is completed, the system will be rebooted. This is similar to Shamoon. Um, so, you know, here's a nice graphic to be able to kind of uh, keep these two operations together and, and, and understand some of their similarities and some of their differences, hopefully. Um, as you can see with Shamoon 2.0 um, and Stone Drill, there was a certain emphasis on um, targeting, particularly with Saudi Arabia. One interesting thing with Stone Drill is there's actually uh, a target in Europe, which was uh, kind of an eye-opening thing for us. Since when we first discovered Stone Drill, these samples were just uh, had been uploaded to to a multi-scanner service, all coming from Saudi Arabia, and yet uh, we hadn't seen any attacks actually going on in the wild. However, uh, the European victim, which you know, for reasons of, of for operational reasons and investigational reasons, of course, we're not going to go further into who that European victim actually is. Uh, but the, the European victim was targeted and uh, actually sort of set off this idea that, that 
stone drill is in the wild. They are very much running their operations so far. And while we haven't seen any loud and costly damage just yet, as we had seen with Shamoon, uh, it's clear that the attackers are quite interested in this. All right. So, of course, as I said, you know, we love our Yara hunting. And, of course, we weren't going to stop in this interesting case with just one Yara rule. Uh, so, once we had stone drill uh, clustered into a certain specific set of samples, we wanted to see what else we could find uh, that might be related to this attacker or to this campaign. So we wrote the following rule, as you can see. It is actually a, a byte matching rules related to a specific uh, set of functions within Stone Drill. And we ran this through our collections, as we often do, in the hopes of finding more samples. And something interesting came up. When you take those rules, that, that particular rule, and you run it over other, uh, other samples that have already been discovered as being interesting, one thing kept coming up for us, and that was samples related to something that we call new speech. Um, it, it, it's actually an APT actor that some of you may know under the name Charming Kitten as well. Um, we have actually provided uh, upwards of three or four reports to our uh, Threat Intel private subscribers over the past uh, year or so. And um, what interest what's interesting about Newspeed, it's an operation that um, has been ongoing since about February 2016 when it was discovered, um, and it tends to leverage the, what is known as the browser exploitation framework. So hence the name, you know, Beef is, is a bit of an uh, abbreviation of this. So what we're starting to understand here is given the, the level of um, code similarity between Stone Drill and Newsbeef, we can start to expect that while the connection between Shamoon and Stone Drill itself may be a little tenuous, the connection between Stone Drill and Newsbeef is actually very well cemented and very interesting as it you know, shows us an evolution of what Newsbeef is doing by coming up with this new platform with this sort of advanced wiping functionality. So some of those key findings include that evolution. They also include a certain level of code reuse or code sharing, which for us tends to provide a very solid link when it comes to close, close source malware. And there are also some other small quirks and similarities that we, we may want to focus on to strengthen that case. So some of those similarities, as you may be able to see here, I mean, I, you know, I, unless there are a few of you that are actually taking up reversing on the side, uh, it may not be entirely apparent right away, but if you can see some of the comparisons in, in some, for example, the update command uh, within some different uh, news beef samples and different nose uh, um, stone drill samples, you can actually see that, you know, while there is a certain amount of evolution, there are very many uh, similarities in some of the implementations of this code, which for us tend to prove um, quite solid. Uh, similarly, with the string decryption routine, as you might see below, that we've, we've made sure to kind of uh, comment this properly so that it might become obvious to those of you that, that may not have a pension for uh, malware reverse engineering. Uh, but you can see the certain level of similarity that to us implies a, sh a shared code base. It may be improved, but it, it continues just to provide a shared code base for us. Uh, similarly, uh, the win main signatures between Newsbeef and Stone Drill are uh, fairly similar, not exactly the same. And then if you can look at some of the command and control uh, servers that are being used by these different operations, uh, you can actually see a similar naming convention. It isn't the same command and control servers, but if you look at some of the old uh, Newsbeef uh, C2s, you can see names like chrome-up.date uh, that were being used for servers or service1.chrome-up.date. Uh, in the case of Stone Drill, we see something very similar, which is chrome, miss, missing the E, no-up.com. Uh, similarly, serve uh, irc.com versus e serve ic.com. Uh, these are not the same command and control servers. They're not, you know, being contacted the same way, uh, but they actually imply a certain similarity in, in naming and registration, which to us uh, is more to do with the trend of the actor than it is to do with the actual immediate ownership, which is very, very interesting. 
Uh, in order to be able to kind of envision all of this very clearly, we've got a nice central graphic here. So you can see some of the similarities and differences between Stone Drill and Shamoon that we have mentioned. Uh, as we've said, there's a certain uh, operational period that Shamoon 2.0 and Stone Drill share from October to November in 2016. They do have a similar interest in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they both store their payloads inside of these encrypted resources with similar or the same names, which is actually what allowed us to discover uh, Stone Drill coming from Shamoon 2.0. However, uh, Stone Drill has more advanced evasion techniques than Shamoon does. It uses external scripts, uh, uh, VBS scripts, in order to delete its own components, which is something Shamoon does not do. Uh, it also uh, injects the wiper into the memory uh, of the victim's preferred browser, as I mentioned, whereas Shamoon 2.0 still uses this old technique of uh, abusing legitimate drivers. Um, and while Stone Drill has Persian language artifacts, uh, Shamoon 2.0 shows Arabic Yemeni artifacts. Uh, as I said, take that with uh, maybe two spoonfuls of salt. Um, that said, on the other side, if you look at Stone Drill and Newsbeast, uh, there are actually some very strong similarities between uh, the, the Stone Drill and Newsbeef uh, code bases. You've got that, that similarity in the WinMain code. Uh, you have some of the backdoor commands and functionality which are shared between the two, a shared string decryption routine, um, and the similarity in convention and naming for the command and control servers. So I think that, uh, you know, if we were to enumerate our theories, uh, we could say, you know, either uh, Shamoon and, and uh, Stone Drill are the same group. That's a possibility. They are totally unrelated. It's also possibility number two. Possibility number three is that they are separate groups uh, with aligned interests. And I think that for the time being, as far as the evidence goes, uh, and you know, keeping some of the hype to a minimum, uh, we would say that that theory three, the idea that they're separate groups aligned in their interests, is perhaps the ones that we would espouse. Uh, the most at this time. That said, we believe that the Stone Drill and Newsbeef connection is very strong, and we would categorize Stone Drill as a sort of evolution of the Newsbeef operations. So that said, you know, putting the fear of God a little bit out there, um, we hope that we can also remind you that Kaspersky is very committed to its range of services and products that we can provide in order to defend against these sorts of threats uh, and against, you know, sort of the big, bad, uh, scary world that can be out there in, in, in the Internet for those of us that are attempting to not only operate but sustain businesses and, and enterprises uh, within this new world. Um, we want to remind you of some of the range of products that we provide, but also in sort of the philosophy that we have in going forward to protect enterprises and protect high-value consumers and customers, uh, to understand that, um, especially from our research angle, we definitely see the need uh, to run this in a sort of intelligence cycle, to understand that there's not only a level of risk management involved, there's a need for continuous monitoring, there's a need for incident management and incident response, and then, uh, you know, what my team does best, which is to hunt further, to attempt to predict, uh, to attempt to have a certain level of situational awareness from a global perspective uh, that allows all enterprises and all consumers, regardless of their in-house talent, to be aware of just how many threats are out there, how these people might be operating, and what uh, the latest cutting-edge threats might be. On that note, uh, for those of you that, that are in enterprises that are interested in threat intelligence, we hope that you'll be aware of our threat intelligence subscription service. A lot of our research recently, uh, despite uh, the amount of research that we used to publish, uh, a lot of our research has also gone on to, into this threat intelligence subscription model where we attempt to, to provide interested consumers in a more of a deep dive technical analysis and making sure that uh, these enterprises that have the most to defend and the most to lose from the attacks of advanced threat actors uh, can also get a sense of exactly what these threat actors are doing up to the bleeding cutting edge of research uh, to know about entirely undiscovered threat actors, which is why that tree that I showed at the beginning is, is so underpopulated when it comes to 2016 and 2017. Uh, despite the fact that our techniques have gotten better at finding new threat actors, uh, these are mostly going to our subscribers. So if any of you are interested, we hope that you'll come in, take some of our actionable intelligence away with you know, some nice YAR rules and IOCs. Um, and on that note, for those of you that are also interested in getting into research, we hope that you'll consider uh, this an open invitation for you to join us for uh, not just our, our private conference at the end of the year, sorry, uh, in April, the middle of the year, 
uh, but also to to join us for some of the training, such as uh, you know using Maltigo uh, to do this sort of research, and more importantly, one of my favorites, the malware reverse engineering course with one of the absolute legends of reversing, which is uh, Nico Brule, who's part of our team. So we hope that you'll consider that as well.